No, we're not suffering from technical difficulties. We are live and in living color. From the studios of Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Hickson. And I'm Roman Reigns, also known you as You wish. Christian. Yeah. If you're Roman Reigns, then I'm Seth Rollins. But then again, uh, he's not even in action because he's still recovering from his knee injury. But that's beside the point. The point is, we're very happy that you could join us, and we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about, starting with some uh, really good news that took place uh, just about a week and a half ago. Wagner College was kind enough to invite us to their press conference to introduce the new women's basketball coach. So, Kenny Graham, if you please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wagner College. Welcome to everyone here in attendance in person and those tuned in on NECfrontrow.com. I'm John Weiser, Assistant Athletic Director of uh, Communications here at Wagner College, welcoming you to this uh, exciting day. Uh, I'd like to recognize a, a few folks first before we get going. Uh, Northeast Conference Commissioner Noreen Morris is here. We thank her for her attendance. And our new coach's former boss, athletic director at Adelphi University, Danny McCabe, is in the back. Welcome. So, so I'll be real brief. Uh, how, how this is going to go is I'm going to introduce our, our president, Dr. Richard Garassi, next, and then he's going to introduce our athletic director, Walt Hamline, and then we're going to hear from the new coach. And she's going to make a few remarks when she's done. For media that are here, we can do one-on-one -on -one interviews. We have a backdrop uh, in the back of the room. We can get that done. We have some of our current student athletes here as well. And uh, we'll get you whatever you need. So uh, welcome. And without further ado, Wagner College President, Dr. Richard Garassi. Thank you. Thank you, John. Welcome, Heather. Welcome to Wagner. Delight to have you here. I had the privilege of interviewing Heather uh, in my office. Uh, week or so ago, uh, and uh, she impressed me immensely. Uh, I'm going to let Walt talk about the athletic record. What impressed me the most was her letter and then her conversation with me about all the things off the court that she was concerned about, the academic development of her players, the development of young women into leaders, a life beyond basketball. These are things that I really am concerned about in addition to the wins and losses and all that sort of stuff. I leave that in this building. My, my job is, is to make sure that that Heather's the kind of person who's really concerned about the, the, the life of the young women beyond Wagner and preparing them correctly and giving them the kind of leadership opportunities and notion of team building and the like that are essential skills as we go forward. And she, you did. You impressed me immensely. Uh, this is a very self-confident young woman uh, who I think will bring a lot to Wagner. I'm pretty excited that you're here. And uh, welcome. Welcome very much. Without further ado, you really want to hear from Heather. You don't want to hear from me. If you want to hear from me, you can come over to my office and we can do a couple of hours together. But absent that, because um, I'm in the middle of a fundraising campaign, so any, any one of you could have a name on this building. Um, so uh, the leader of the ship here in terms of the quality and the depth and the commitment we have as an, ed as an educational program and connected to a fabulous athletic experience for our students is Walt Hamline. So Walt, please come on up. Thank you, Thank you Richard. And thank you for your leadership. Um, we started this process a, a while back, and uh, just like anything, there's a great supply and demand when it comes to coaches. Uh, we had over a, a hundred applications, and just like anything, we broke them up into different segments as we we started this process. And uh, we put a committee together, and uh, Peg Heffern led that as the associate athletic director for. Uh, Wagner Athletics and all the other people that were involved. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for, for your time and efforts there. As we went through this process and uh, it came to a point where um, Heather jumped out at us from a standpoint that she had been a head basketball coach. And with that, she had taken over two programs that had not been very successful. Um, so as we moved forward, this was something that you know, boy, she did one heck of a job at these two places. And as we checked her references, uh, it came down to a pretty simple process of extremely organized, had a plan in place, and had a plan to build a foundation at each one of these institutions. And by doing that, went step by step 
and at the end of the river one basketball game. But as Richard had indicated, uh, all the other things that go with a successful program at the intercollegiate athletic uh, is really important. And a few of those things are player development. Um, the thing that got me, there was a video that she put together at Adelphi about her basketball program. And it talked about academics. Um, and at the end of the day, all her student athletes excelled in the classroom. They had a, a, a program where there was uh, support staff, which was shown. They talked about community service and showed where their kids were out in the community and, and did service. Uh, things that tied into a big picture, just like we have here at Wagner College. And it's just not about uh, playing basketball. It's about growing in leadership for each one of our student athletes and to encompass those things. And she did an excellent job there. The players, a weight program was showing, their workout ethic was showing, uh, high energy, real intense. And then the other thing, how they played on the court. And the bottom line there was they won, which we all look at at the end of the day, did you win or did you lose? And they played with great, great intensity. And with that intensity, you could see a chemistry. And she tied all that in at two places. And at the end of the day, um, not splitting atoms, but that whole program at both places encompassed those things. And I've always said, from our standpoint here, at the end, we hope that each one of our student athletes can walk away and be able to look back and say, I got a great education. Part of my education was athletics, along with all those other things. And uh, it's without any reservation, uh, and I'm excited. And I know she is, and she's off and running hard, and we're trying to keep up with her right now a little bit. And, uh, but I, I feel extremely confident that she's going to put an outstanding staff together. She's going to program our kids and develop our student athletes, and we're going to win. I really believe that. I, I've always gone with what I think of as a gut feeling, and I really have a really good gut feeling with you. And uh, at the end of the day, um, we're going to give you support you as much as you can. You're going to work your tail off, okay? You got that straight and, and uh, do all the things you've been doing. We're really happy you're here and welcome. Coach Jay. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking our president, Dr. Grassi, Wall Hamlin, Peg Heffron, somewhere back there. Now oh, there you go and the entire committee for providing me with this opportunity. I'd also like to acknowledge Danny McCabe, Coach Duke even, thank you for coming, and our Adelphi family. They allowed me the opportunity to lead the Adelphi women's basketball program for the past six years. Without this foundation, I wouldn't be able to stand up here before you today. I also want to express my gratitude to Phil Rowe and John Griffith from Daniel Webster College. They gave me an opportunity, my first head coaching opportunity, and they saw the potential in a young head coach. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my family. Thank you for your patience, your support, your compassion, and your listening ears. In my previous two positions, as Walt mentioned, I have led program turnarounds. This was a natural progression in my career. Today, I want to express how excited I am to be the next head coach of Wagner women's basketball. From the moment I walked on campus, the community and the energy were notable. There's a standard of excellence, a foundation that was laid the moment Wall Hamline won a national championship. Coach Mason and the men's staff have continued with that tradition with the Wagner men's basketball team. One of my main goals here is to raise the women's team to that same standard of excellence. What they have done is a direct result of hard work and vision. I have a tremendous amount of respect for their program and I'm looking forward to working alongside them. I'm especially excited about the opportunity to take this program to the next level. The expectations for success have already begun. Basketball is a tool a vehicle to help these young women grow as people 
and to further develop their character. You can expect Wagner women's basketball to be selfless, to employ teamwork every possession. We're going to push the ball after makes. We're going to push the ball after misses. Girls, athletes, I want you to be able to play with the freedom to make reads and react to the defense. Our defensive identity will be one of toughness, grit. We're going to smother our opponents and make them feel our presence every time they have the ball. I believe that by taking care of the athletes and the little things that matter, then success will follow. Our main goal will be to live by and embody championship standards. Be assured that my staff and I, we will grind, we will work, we will do whatever necessary to elevate this program, all the while never compromising our core values and our integrity. Our athletes and our staff will have a growth mindset, a commitment to leaving the program as better people and players than when they first entered. Every member of our program will operate with both integrity and discipline. We will compete relentlessly on the court, in the classroom, and for recruits. As we all know, recruiting is the backbone to any successful program. My staff and I will work tirelessly to assemble a group of young women who will represent the Wagner community with class and dignity. We also want to recruit people that understand and value education. Those individuals that are good people, good students, terrific athletes, and most importantly, will be model citizens in the community at large. Our goal is to attract student athletes that share our vision. We will bring players that are ready to compete at the highest level. Those individuals that are ready to help lead Wagner women's basketball to championships. Thank you for your warm welcome, and I look forward to seeing you all in the stands. Thank you, Heather. That's our new head basketball coach, Heather Jacobs. Kind of a tough act to follow. Um, that concludes the uh, formal part of our uh, show today. Um, we're going to ask uh, Richard and Walt and, uh, and Coach to come up for a couple of quick photos, if we could. And then for the media members who are here, uh, Coach will be available in the back, as well as some of her student athletes uh, for some one-on-one Q&A. All right. So thank you again for your attendance. Feel free. We got uh, refreshments in the back, and thank you again. It is with great honor and pleasure that I introduce to you the new women's basketball coach here at Wagner College, Heather Jacobs. A pleasure meeting you, Heather. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Nice to meet you, too. I'm well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm well, thank you. Well, this is quite a jump you're making. You've gone from the friendly confines of your home area in New England to Long Island, and now you've made the jump from D2 up to D1. Mm -hmm. And you've had some really really good success at the two colleges that you were at, but now you've gone to the pressure cooker of D1 where a lot of the big time basketball is being played and also a lot of pressure is being put on these coaches to win. Do you feel that you're ready to make that jump to the big time? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the game doesn't change, the age of the athletes doesn't change. You need to recruit bigger, faster, stronger, but and I feel like someone like myself, you have a blueprint in place, you're ready. Our friend John Beaster said something that was really important at the beginning of the press conference, and that you are looking to really stress the academic part of the program here. Mm -hmm. Why? I think for a lot of reasons, actually. Number one, they're students before athletes. Their education is what's going to carry them after their time as basketball players and everything is connected. The way you do something is the way you do everything. You were really upfront about your philosophy of basketball. You wanted to push the tempo offensively and defensively. You really wanted your players to be up in their faces. Was that something that you stressed when you were coaching in the D2 level? 
Yes, absolutely. I was fortunate to have some players that really continue playing now, but we led our conference in scoring two out of the past three years, so I think that, that those similar philosophies are still applicable to the next level. You just need to get different players. Mm -hmm. For those Wagner fans that are watching right now mm -hmm. that are going to be checking your team out next season, mm -hmm. give everybody uh, a little bit of your background in the game. As far as the, what my teams have looked like before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, yeah. And also your own personal background as a basketball player and a basketball coach. Gritty. I've always, I was gritty as a player, and my teams have played the same way. You'll see my teams wear knee pads because they're going to get on the floor. They're going to get after it, take care of their controllables, play hard, and really share the basketball. Collective effort, collective responsibility, and accountability. And then in turn, it all ties into playing tough, playing tenacious, and gritty. What position were you playing when you were a player? I played everything but everything wherever coach needed me. That was my role when I was a player. I actually, similar, my freshman year, our head coach, I got a new head coach. So my role, he really stuck me in different places. And each year, depending on injuries or whatever happened, would, my role would be different. So basically, you played all five positions on the floor, correct? My experience at point guard was the... The, la the least of my responsibilities, but there were times when I had to play the center and times when I had to play the two guard. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that point guards and head coaches have in common, and that's the ability to see the floor at all times. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you try to bring in to the game as a coach in addition to your responsibilities back in the day when you were playing point and other positions? I mean, my, my experiences playing point guard weren't nearly like any other position. It was really just a once in a blue moon type of thing if necessary. I try to spend time now as a coach with my point guards just to, ex to go over expectations, communication strategies, systems, because they're the floor general out there. They're the one that really has to manage the game and we have to be on the same page. And I've been lucky to have some really talented point guards and some selfless leaders over the past few years and some that I've even worked with. So it's, I think, that relationship and that ability to communicate and be on the same page is extremely important. You grew up in Massachusetts, but you've spent quite a few years here in the New York area, where, as we all know, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. <laughs> what was it like for you, a Massachusetts native who probably grew up a Celtics fan, getting involved in the basketball scene here in the Big Apple. I'm still a Celtics fan. Hasn't changed to Boston through and through, but I appreciate my time here in New York. I've made, met a lot of amazing people, but it can't change the fact that I'm a Celtics fan, and you know, now especially Brad Stevens. I've always been a Brad Stevens fan too, so that uh, I think that'll always remain. Did you have a favorite player growing up? No, I mean, I just love sports in general. I'm mm -hmm. from football to hockey to basketball. I just love to play everything and be around the games. Mm -hmm. As far as coming to Wagner itself, you mentioned that the energy here was something that really stood out. What other factors figured into your decision to call Wagner home? The people. The people make the place. I was there were warm, welcoming, extremely kind during my time here. And then the place is beautiful. I think there has a lot to offer, you know, as an institution and an athletic department. It's a place where student athletes can grow as people, students, and then basketball players. Aside from hoping to bring them to the next level, which is a possible Northeast Conference Championship mm -hmm. and maybe an NCAA tournament, mm -hmm. what other goals have you set for the team? We want to have a culture. We want to have an identity of teamwork. We want to make sure that we play hard. We take care of the little things. I'm a big believer in ma taking care of your culture, putting the athletes first as people, academics, and then in turn the rest will come. If you play and you live and you embody championship standards in everything you do, championships will follow. Noticing your resume, you have done quite a bit to turn around the two previous programs that you had been at. First, uh, Daniel Webster College and most recently at Delphi, which long has had a reputation for really good teams. Why have your teams been so successful in your eyes? I've had great players that bought into a team philosophy. I've really been blessed to just to have those athletes. They were willing to put their personal, any 
everything personal with God and, and to really surrender their goals for the ultimate team goal. And in turn, they end up getting both. But the players, absolutely. The players and my staffs. Over the years, I've had staffs that have worked. And now they're you know all over the place, all over the map, because they've grown into the next step of their career, which, of course, I support. Um, but I credit both, the, both to the staff and the players. You still look really young enough to probably still play the game. Do you still pick up the rock and shoot <laughs> every once in a while? Or is that part of your, uh, your career officially on the back burner? As long as no one's around, I don't mind picking up a rock. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Coach, congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to speak to Noreen Morris, who's the commissioner of the Northeast Conference, which Wagner calls home. Pleasure meeting you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Another historic moment for the college here on Grimes Hill. What does it say about not only Wagner, but about the Northeast Conference that such a promising coach like Heather is going to be making her way here? Yeah, I think Nor the Northeast Conference has a storied history in women's basketball. We've been very strong in the past with programs that have been um, consistently at the top, and that would be teams like Sacred Heart, St. Francis University, and I know that Wagner has aspirations of being at the top. And the Heather, hiring Heather uh, and listening to her speak at the press conference, I can tell that she's going to be successful here, um, and I think um, that the foundation she's going to set, both on the court and off the court, fits perfectly with the Wagner culture, which is very committed to the total student athlete, not only on the court, but in the classroom and the community. So I think all of those things combined that uh, she has certainly set herself up for success. Northeast Conference has so many great things going. Just recently, it was Fairleigh Dickinson that won the men's title. And you also had a lot of success uh, for the women's circuit as well. Now with the spring sports, baseball and lacrosse have taken full circle. Where do you see the league in the next, I would say, five years or so? Uh, with the spring sports or just generally? In general. Okay, in general, I would say we have certainly put us um, an emphasis on basketball, both men's and women's basketball. Uh, and you'll see that in the amount of television coverage we've increased. We had a record high, 34 games, which was uh, included 11 games for women's basketball and ESPN3. So from a basketball standpoint, we hope that the institution's continued commitment with hires such as Heather, um, that we continue to see the rise competitively. Uh, in terms of some of the spring sports that we're working on uh, with now, uh, we've had some really good wins this year with uh, Bryant baseball. Uh, is uh, last I saw had been ranked in the top 25 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, St. Joe's lacrosse just beat Bryant to I think clinch um, home seed and home uh, field advantage for the NEC championship uh, so we're really excited about those two sports and, and the future and of course softball is always an exciting event for us uh, I'm not quite sure where that's falling out right now I'm not sure we have a, a front runner right now, um, but mm -hmm. that season is a, a week or so behind the others, so there's still lots of games to play. Um, and we just finished, uh, the NEC just hosted the NCAA Bowling Championship this past weekend. So um, while we didn't have a team in the eight-team field, it was a really successful event, which put, the, I think, the Northeast on the map in terms of being a really good host um, for future N NCAA championships. So we hope to do more championships, not only bowling, but potentially um, partner up and, and do some basketball or some future events. It's interesting that you mentioned the hosting part. You mentioned uh, hosting the bowling championship. Talk about the process of playing host to a particular sport. What does it consist of in addition to finding a venue for the tournament? What happens there? Uh, well, the NCAA has a very uh, detailed uh, and time-sensitive bidding process. So we bid on this event three years ago for the NCAA bowling, and so we submit a bid with uh, some financial uh, budgets uh, with a location. You work, so we, we happen to work with the Carolier Lanes uh, in North Brunswick, New Jersey. They had hosted back in 2010 um, when Fairleigh Dickinson actually won the national championship. 
and they beat Nebraska at that point in time. So we knew that that was a great site to host, so we asked them to partner with us uh, in hosting the championship. So um, we did such a good job, I think they'd like for us to put in another bid, so we'll talk about that as a staff. It was a four-day event, and it, I mean, the last day we arrived at 6.45 in the morning, and we didn't get out of there till after 11 p.m. at night. So that was the last of very four very long days uh, leading into our staff now. We had two people leave this morning for Florida at 6 a.m. Uh, to host our golf championship, and we have eight championships to run the next couple of weeks. So uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us, and after a really long four days with our NSA bowling, they've got to just turn it out and, and, and get ready to host uh, and do a great job for all of our sports. Mm -hmm. It's all about the student-athlete experience, and we want – every team that's participating in NC, NEC championship to feel like it's a special event and that we're giving them everything we possibly can for them to have a good experience. Your league has also been successful in sending a, a few players to the pros. Uh, back in the day when Ryder was a member, there was a great player, Jason Thompson, who's now making his mark in the NBA after almost a decade. And most recently, Wagner sent uh, a player to the NFL to play for the Vikings. What does that say about the league that they have been able to still produce some really talented players to get to the next level? I think this league, uh, not only the, the two that you mentioned, um, we've had a number of student athletes, both on the men's and women's side, playing internationally as pros. Um, and, you know, when you look at the Northeast Conference of schools within the conference, and if you listen to Dr. Grassi inside, it is about the education and that athletics is part of the education and the fact that our student athletes then can pursue their dream of playing professional yet have that degree to fall back on if a professional doesn't work out. And we all know professional, you know, average NFL is I think four years um, and uh, basketball maybe eight to ten average and that might be on the high side. So even if you do go pro, that's a great experience. But in a short time frame, you're going to be back and have to come up with a career to, to support you and your family. So I think we give the both, best of both worlds that you have the opportunity to go pro, whether it's international or domestic, yet still have your degree and uh, can have a career to aspire to after your professional experience. Talk about your own career in sports. How did you get your start? And also, what's it been like for you running a top-of-the-line league such as the NEC? Uh, I played soccer in college at Cornell, and uh, after a year of, quote-unquote, working in the real world in Boston, uh, I went back as a, an assistant coach at Cornell and did that for two years. I uh, realized that coaching was not necessarily my passion. As much as I enjoyed it, I knew it wouldn't be a career for me, so I went to graduate school for sports management. And from there, I got an internship at UConn, I uh, worked for Pat Miser McNett, who just retired recently at Hartford as a 20-year uh, athletic director. Uh, was hired on um, after that year of internship as their first full-time compliance coordinator at UConn. Went from there to Conference USA, worked for eight years as a compliance and governance. Worked with two very um, successful commissioners, Mike Slive, who recently retired as the SEC commissioner, and Britton Bonoski, um, who just left Conference USA to run a nonprofit. Uh, connected to the college football playoff. From there, I went to Northwestern uh, as an associate AD and worked with Mark Murphy. He left to take this small job, uh, GM of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> uh, and then Jim Phillips uh, it was the second uh, AD I worked with there. He's the current chair of the NSA leadership, or actually NSA council. Uh, I was there five and a half years, at which point I took the job here at Northeast Conference. I've been here seven years. Or starting my seventh year in uh, January. Mm -hmm. So I love this conference, um, as you've heard today. Um, and I, you know, kind of emphasize it again. It's about the whole person. It's about the education. Um, and that athletics is part of the education. And I think that our approach to athletics in the NEC is the correct one for college athletics. You know, we, we want to develop the person to be a better person from whence they came in and when they graduated. So I, and our athletic directors, um, they are so involved. Um, they know student athlete names. They're at the games. They understand um, what's happening in the student athletes' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And the support staffs that we have in our conference are wonderful. So I really think that I, I really appreciate and um, respect 
this league and how they go about their business and that we are doing what college athletics was meant to do, which is have athletics be a part of your education and one that's positive. That is a really, really impressive resume that you, uh, that you have there. Cornell itself, their reputation for academic excellence pretty much speaks for itself. Discuss your time as a Cornell student athlete. Mm -hmm. What was it like there? And also, what was your major? And what type of course load did you go through? Uh, well, I had a great experience. Um, I was actually the first recruited class at Cornell. So they had just started the uh, program the year prior. Um, and so you know, I was able to help build that program um, and create a culture that you know we won, uh, we were successful right away. We had a couple of All-Americans, uh, and so to be part of something new um, was special, uh, and it was something that helped me kind of move into a leadership role early on. Uh, as in the first recruited class, the freshmen were the leaders in a sense. So I was a two-time um, captain as a junior and senior, and in that case, sometimes the seniors, you know. When I was a junior, the seniors who helped start the program um, were still on the team. So that was an interesting dynamic in which you learn how to lead um, up and down. Uh, my course load, uh, I took four to five classes uh, each term. I graduated in four years um, and had a great experience. I was a consumer economics major in the School of Community Ecology, mm -hmm. um, but took classes throughout. The Cornell has seven different schools, so I took classes in hotel school, arts and sciences, uh, industrial and labor relations, uh, and really tried to get a well-rounded, um, somewhat geared toward business, uh, as well as the consumer economics. So I thought it was a great combination and beautiful campus, a little cold in the winter, uh, beautiful campus, great people, and, and uh, in fact, I just spent a weekend recently with some of my college roommates um, and kind of celebrating one of those milestone birthdays, I won't tell you which, but <laughs> so we still keep in touch. Um, so lifelong friendships. Ma'am, excellent job. Thank you so much. You Continued much. success and good luck to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Now before I begin, I want to give a special word of thanks to everyone involved at Wagner College. From John Beezer to Walt Hamline to Heather Jacobs, the commissioner of the Northeast Conference as well. Everyone was so kind in letting us uh, bring our cameras over to film this really, really promising event that's going to be taking place. Looks like Wagner College is going to be in really good hands with the women's team. Oh, yes. I uh, felt the determination uh, from their new head coach. So uh, best of luck uh, to uh, the Seahawks women's basketball team. Can't wait to hear more from them in the future. Yep. But they, they're going to roll the basketballs out in October. So hopefully they will be able to build something really good with this program. Speaking of building something good, it looks like they're uh, building something really good with the Mets right now. Uh, well, up until yesterday anyway. Oh, yeah. The Mets have won 11 out of their last 13. They had an eight-game winning streak going into uh, yesterday's match against the Giants. Unfortunately, they did lose 6-1. to one. Mm -hmm. Madison Bumgarner are part of that amazing trio with him, Johnny Quayle, and Jeff Samarja that have gone 10-4 and four in the year. Uh, he was able to lead the Giants to a much-needed victory against the uh, Mets as opposed to what Jake Peavy and uh, their other pitcher have done, uh, Matt Cain, have done against the Mets. In fact, I'm hearing recently Tim Linscombe, is actually putting on a clinic this Friday after overcoming hip surgery mm -hmm. for all teams to possibly sign him. It's amazing that he still hasn't found a job yet because in spite of the fact that he slumped badly the last two or three years, he's still an effective pitcher. He can help somebody. It's, the, it's just a matter of where is he going to be the right fit with. And the money. Yeah. That's the thing. Money's going to be a big thing because he's going to command a lot of money for a guy who's won – a couple of championships in the past. Especially two Cy Youngs in a row many years ago. But you know what? Best of luck to him. As for the Mets, though, 11-2 in the last 13 games. Mm -hmm. They've averaged over six runs a game. The, the bullpen has actually done its job. The offense has come out of their slump when they were in that 2-5 and five stretch. And the pitching staff. You know, Steven Matz, ever since that horrible first start where he didn't even last one inning, He's won three games. Yeah. So he's really off to a good start. He's almost equaling the amount of wins he had last year when he came uh, 
late into the season with the Mets, the Long Island native. As for the rest of the rotation, Matt Harvey really needs to start getting his uh, work together. Jacob Grum, he's 2-1 and one on the season. Noah Syndergaard is an ERA below one right now. You know, Thor is doing his job, and yeah. Bartol Colon, if he wins tonight, he will tie. He will actually break the tie he has with Pedro Martinez for the most wins amongst Dominican-born pitchers. He's still a ways from— He's still Mar a long ways away from catching up to uh, Juan Marichal, who is the all-time winner with about, I think, 240 wins in his career. Yep. But you mentioned Syndergaard. Last night—well, yesterday, he ran into Madison Bumgarner, and it just wasn't their day. The, uh, Madison Bumgarner showed why he is the best pitcher in the game right now. But except for yesterday— Syndergaard has been doing really, really well for himself, so much that he has emerged as the star of that staff. Notice the uh, Noah Syndergaard uh, gnomes that they were giving out at City Field I think just recently. It's not just even him, though. Offensively, ever since they moved Mike Confort, Confort, the outfielder, to the number three slot, he's hit over 300. He's a beast. You know, that's really been the main— and him and Cespedes in the three and four spot in the lineup, they really have fed off of each other. Neil Walker has been a godsend since we acquired him from Pittsburgh. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, honestly, he plays very well defensively at his position, mm -hmm. and he can hit. Yeah. Everything is clicking for this team. The depth is there. This team has the ability to make a really good run to October. Yep. As opposed to the Yankees. Con granted, it's only been one month, but— the Mets are looking really good right now. And speaking of whom, they're playing the Braves right now, and they've already jumped ahead of the Braves for nothing right now, thanks to home runs from David Wright, Yoannis Cespedes, who has a two-run home run, and Lucas Duda. Well, you're you're talking about a Braves team that hasn't even gotten their sixth home run on the season. You think of 29 games and over 100 at bats, and they still collectively as a team can't even get their sixth home run. Mm -hmm. Trevor Story, the shortstop for the uh, Colorado Rockies, the rookie has more home runs than the entire Atlanta Braves. That's sad and pathetic right mm -hmm. there. Their rotation is a joke. They are destined to get the number one pick in the amateur draft for yeah. next year the way things are going. Well, this could be playing right into the Braves' hands because as baseball fans know very well, the Braves have built all of their contenders from the past through their farm system. This is no exception. The Braves have really stockpiled their system with good kids. It's Needless to say, it's going to take a little while for them to be back into contender status, but right now the Braves look horrible. Yeah. As now, speaking of horrible, the Yankees. Yeah. As far as the Yankees are concerned, I know it's only been a month, but man, they look dreadful. They can't hit. They can't pitch. First and foremost, this team cannot score any runs because they cannot hit. Right now, Starlin Castro has been their best hitter, and he's a 313 hitter. Everybody else has been 260 and below. A-Rod has been terrible up until yesterday when he got the two home runs. Mark Teixeira can't hit the side of a barn. As far as their pitching staff is concerned, after Masahiro Tanaka, everybody else has an ERA of four and above. And how about Nathan Eovaldi almost having that no-no this past week and unfortunately broken up in the seventh inning? You know, and he pitched, and he wound up pitching last night against David Price of the Red Sox. Both of those guys wound up getting their butts kicked, but yet David got the win. He, yes, David's four and zero, but if you look at the games he's won, that's because of his offense, not his pitching. At times, the bet, the real ace of that rotation has been Rick Porcello, mm -hmm. who's having ER, who has a five and zero record on the season and ERA below one. Mm -hmm. He's really been you know, their ace in the rotation, as opposed to David Price, who they paid over two hundred million for. Yeah, that's crazy in itself, right there. And the future of that Red Sox squad, if you look at it, like Xander Bogarts, yeah, hit. Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley Jr., Brock Holt, who right now has emerged to be a really good hitter, and Henry Owens, Henry their, Owens, who's become a stud pitcher for them. And with this being David Ortiz's swan song, because he says he's going to retire right now uh, at the end of the season, this is becoming Dustin Pedroia's team. Oh, without a doubt. And you, you talk about pitchers this year that really 
uh, Jake Arrieta, guy who's had a no hitter already, two no hitters and eleven starts in that span. That's really amazing in itself. And to think this guy was cast off by the Baltimore Orioles. I know. And there are people accusing Arietta right now of having PEDs, which is nonsense <laughs> to me. I don't think that's even the case with him. But, Sour grapes, if you ask me. But speaking of PEDs, D. Gordon, who won the batting title last year for the Miami Marlins, got suspended for 80 games this past Friday. Mm-hmm. Because he was guilty of taking PEDs. At least he owned up to his mistake. As for the – how about the, the city of Chicago on the north and the south side? The Cubs and the White Sox are both off to great starts. The Cubs themselves – Who saw that? Who saw – well, the Cubs is one thing because the Cubs are expected to win a World Series, and that's really saying something considering their history. But who saw the White Sox coming out of nowhere – to be over 500 the way they are. I don't think I even saw the White Sox, considering the whole issue with Adam LaRoche and that locker room that w- looked like they were going to implode because of the situation. Who would have thought, you know, with the top th- that Chris Sally, Jose Quintana, you know, really would have been a great, and Matt Latos, mm-hmm. that trio right there. They have a, probably one of the best bullpen ERAs in all of baseball. You know, everything is just clicking right now for yeah. that team. The Cubs, though, they lead the league in quality starts, batting average. They really have a great collective group, even without, you know, one of their players who got injured, unfortunately, this mm-hmm. year in the outfield. It's really, you know, the the north and the south side of Chicago have something really to celebrate. Yes, they do. On top of this past week in the NFL, Chicago got to host – for the second straight year, the annual NFL draft. Mm -hmm. And as you see behind me and Jamie are the symbols of our New York pride. Yes, sir. The Jets and the Giants. And they went Buckeye this year. Yep. The Jets, if I'm not mistaken, wound up getting Eli Apple, who's the defensive back from – The Giants got Eli Apple. The the Giants wound up getting Eli Apple. So now that means the Giants have two kids named Eli. One is named Manning, who already has a pair of Super Bowls, and the other – pretty ironic that a kid named apple is going to be playing in the big apple i think what's really he was definitely one of the best cornerbacks coming out of the draft out of ohio state he definitely he's got some raw talent right there and Mm -hmm. he's gonna be you know with him and janoris jenkins who they acquired in the offseason they could be a really good duo in that backfield or this could be a bust that you know this is high risk high reward with this pick as for the jets they got a position of need yep Darren Lee, linebacker. They really need to fill that position, and it's just it was really outstanding. Mm-hmm. To me, though, I the pick I really liked in the Giants was Sterling Shepard at Oklahoma. Yeah, th- they have been needing a receiver because they still don't know what's going to happen with Victor Cruz. And if you put him in the same slot with either Cruz, if he's healthy, or Odell Beckham Jr., you're going to have a really dangerous hand. More importantly, you're going to have a receiver who's not going to drop the ball because even in spite of his height, he's 5'10 and a half. He's got great hands. More importantly, he's got really, really good speed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sterling Shepard has got vertical speed that uh, the Giants definitely need to take the pressure of ODB this year. As for the entirety of the draft, the first overall pick, of course, was Jared Goff, quarterback, California. Unfortunately, yes, he's been sacked. He was sacked 83 times in the last three seasons from that California Golden Bears mm-hmm. offense line. He's made some bad interceptions. He does have some accuracy, but he does have a lot of starter potential. He does have a good throwing arm, and he can really work well in Jeff Fisher's system this year. As opposed to Carson Wentz, who got picked by the Eagles, he's a good two-way quarterback, which the NFL is really stressing for in this day and age. And, but he he's not an automatic start. This is a guy who needs at least a year in the bench behind yeah. Sam Bradford to learn. Or if, God forbid, you know, if there are any injury issues or trade issues, which I don't foresee happening with Sam Bradford, but you never know with Sam because he's had two ACL injuries in the past. Yeah, and he's only played one full season in his rookie year. After that, he's been a, a complete medical liability. And I'm going to tell you right now, the Eagles are in much better hands with their future. Because not only do they have a head coach who's quarterback friendly, they also have the guy who could really take them to the next level. The Eagles completely lucked out when they wound up getting Carson Wentz. He was by far the best investment that they could have made with their first over, with their first draft pick. I think that one of the craziest things to happen on draft night was Laramie Tunsil. Hours before the draft even began, there was a 
photo circulated on social media of him wearing a gas mask, unfortunately smoking marijuana, which is the dumbest thing you could ever do is take a photo of yourself smoking something that is mm -hmm. illegal and then putting it on social media. That's, be, that's borderline stupid and career suicide. But the fact is this picture did circulate. It scared the first 12 teams from even selecting him until number 13, the Miami Dolphins, which they – they meet the risk. They took a gamble to select this guy. Why? Who could they have that left tackle? Yeah. Albert, who they acquired years ago in the offseason mm -hmm. from two years ago from Kansas City, who was supposed to be their star left tackle. But the guy got has injury issues. Laramie Tunsil is probably the best pure left tackle in this in this draft class. Mm -hmm. I think he's really going to be a great, uh, great left tackle for this team. Or if you put him on the right side, either way – this guy is going to fill a good a position of need for Adam Gase's first year for the Miami Dolphins. Mm -hmm. And I love what the Cowboys did. Yeah, they did exactly what they were supposed to do, which was get a running back, which is uh, the kid from Ohio State, Ezekiel Elliott. But you look at the draft that they had overall, they did well getting help on defense because they got themselves an outside linebacker, Jalen Smith, a defensive tackle, Malik Collins. But Jalen Smith can't even play this year, but he's there for the future. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. They invest. They really want to. And I love the moment that they showed him. He was at a bowling alley with his family and friends, and he cried, though. Yeah. It was like one of those like emotional roller coaster moments because this kid didn't even know if he was even going to have a career. Mm -hmm. I even like the draft pick of Dak Prescott from Mississippi State. He'd be a, a really good kid for, for Tony Romo to tutor once uh, Romo decides to leave the game. I liked uh, what uh, yeah, the guy from Navy, the quarterback from Navy, being selected by the Baltimore Ravens. That was really, really cool. You know, if, you know, Annapolis-born player right there. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, he has to serve his time in the military. Yep. Keenan Reynolds, of course, is the is the kid in question. Of course, he has to do five years in the Navy first before he can get back to playing football. And we really wish this young man well because he's got one big commitment that he has to make for his country. And you know, sp speaking of uh, commitments and all that, the rate uh, the Broncos made a gamble and a commitment to get Paxton Lynch. Quarterback at Memphis, who some people even thought – Was not ready? Yeah, there were some people who didn't think he was ready or that he wasn't going to be a star. I think he's going to prove all those people wrong. I will not – I'm going to say this right now. Opening night, when the Broncos are at home playing the Panthers, rematch Super Bowl 50, Thursday, September 8th on NBC – Paxton Lynch, Adam Memphis, will be the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos. I said it. He's going to be the starting quarterback. That just goes to show you where the Broncos' thinking lies because after Peyton Manning retired and they made the Mark Sanchez trade, it was obvious that they were not going to try and cut a deal anytime soon for Colin Kaepernick. So naturally they were going to go for a quarterback in the draft. Paxton Lynch is, is uh, the right move for them. Whether he's ready for the game is or not, Somewhere down the line, this kid is going to be a player somewhere. And I really liked uh, some of the other picks that they had here, especially yeah, Taylor Decker going to the Lions. He could either put him on the left side and put Riley Le Reef on the right, or you could put Taylor Decker on the right side. Either way, this mm -hmm. helps a huge need for them. Uh, the Bills getting Shaq Lawson after Mario Williams left in free agency to go to Miami on a two-year $8 million deal. He's going to be nasty on that yep. on that D one. Mm -hmm. When you think about all the other players that they have, the um, the the Texans getting Will Fuller. You know, you think about the offensive moves they made, getting Brock Osweiler in yep. the off season, signing the deal to get uh, you know Mil Lamar Miller, and also drafting Braxton Miller as another receiver. You know, to go off to get to take the pressure off of DeAndre Hopkins, huge move. Laquan Treadwell to the Vikings. That is a downfield threat that yeah. you know that their quarterback will need for sure. Mm -hmm. Doxon going to the Redskins, that gives Kirk Cousins yet another weapon to throw to. Exactly right. And the Bengals, you know what? They got themselves a good stud corner, William Jackson out of Houston. And the Packers, you know, overall, I really like where this draft went. Robert Enkindichi to the Cardinals. Yeah. Watch out. Mm -hmm. They got Will they got Chandler Jones in the offseason trade with New England, and you add Enkim Ditchie, Yep, it's going to get nasty in the desert. I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Overall, I was happy with the draft. I cannot wait to see 
where uh, these teams go. As for some of the other news, Kentucky Derby is coming up this Saturday, the beginning of horse racing. Mm-hmm. Nyquist, probably the favorite going to the race, has won seven out of seven starts. Mohang, uh, if there's going to be another, more spirit could be the horse that could defeat Nyquist. So those are the two horses in my top two to look for this Saturday from, uh, uh, of course, from Churchill Downs. So break out the min juleps and those lovely hats for the ladies. There you go. As far as uh, what's going on in uh, professional wrestling, they had payback take place over the weekend. You told me about a really uh, disturbing incident that took place during one of the matches. That's right. It was Enzo Mori in his tag match with uh, Colin Cassidy against the Vaude Villains. It was the number one contenders tournament to see who would face a new day for the WWE Tag Team Championship. Unfortunately, during the match, when Enzo Mori was in the ring, was thrown to the uh, second turnbuckle by uh, Simon Gotch of the Vaude Villains. Mm -hmm. His head snapped back, hitting the canvas, and then onto the floor, where he couldn't move whatsoever. The refs had to call the emergent, the doctors, the medical personnel, and a stretcher to get him out of the arena. It was really that bad, where there was no decision whatsoever, but... Uh, During the program, Michael Cole, who was really professional about it, one of my favorite broadcasters that WWE has had for decades, Mm -hmm. was able to announce that he was able to move his extremities, and he was talking to the doctors, which are good signs right there. Because if he didn't do either one, then it was really bad. Yeah. So at least he was able to move his extremities. He was talking to the doctors, but it was concussion he suffered. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know how long he will be out for, but this is really a big blow to a guy who's worked so hard from yeah. the from NXT to go to the main roster. Mm-hmm. But uh, the main event, you had Roman Reigns and AJ Styles. I thought it was a really good match. Mm-hmm. Now, I did not see this, uh, this pay-per-view because I'm still holding out for the really, really big, big pay-per-view later on, which is SummerSlam. But you really raved about this particular title match. Oh, yeah. They had to restart twice because of the way things ended. The first time it ended in uh, a 10 count for uh, Roman Reigns to win. Mm -hmm. No, AJ Styles to to win. But you know what? Uh, What's his name? Shane McMahon came out and restarted the match. Mm -hmm. Then Roman Reigns lost by disqualification to AJ Styles. Mm -hmm. Stephanie comes out, restarts the match. Why did that happen? Well, before that match took place, Mr. McMahon decided to have both Stephanie and Shane have control of Raw. Mm-hmm. That's going to be really interesting starting tonight. As for the ma- the third time that the title match took place, Roman Reigns did win with the patented spear move on AJ Styles, but AJ, you cannot take away what he did in this match. Yeah. He is athletically gifted. It's nice to see AJ Styles get the respect that he deserves uh- in that company because I would see him maybe as a potential champion down the road. He started in January at the Royal Rumble in the number th- five position, I believe, lasting mm-hmm. 28 minutes. To go from that to a title match in a four-month span, that's probably – that's very quick. That's amazing in itself right there. It takes guys years even to get a number one contenders match. Yeah. Let alone get an actual title shot. Mm-hmm. And he did it. As for the women's title, you had a resemblance of the Montreal Screwjob in 97, unfortunately. Dean Ambrose beat Chris Jericho. The Miz defeated Cesaro. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, probably my favorite match of the entire night. Mm -hmm. These were two guys who were friends for years. And Kevin Owens turned his back on Sami Zayn at NXT Revolution years ago. In fact, he powerbombed him onto the edge of the ring canvas, hurting his lower spinal column. Cost Sammy a year of his career. Came back at SummerSlam to screw Kevin Owens out of the title. Mm -hmm. And they've had it for each other since. Now, I think what happened last night, though, is going to be a fatal four-way at Extreme Rules for the Intercontinental title Mm -hmm. with all four of these guys. Mm -hmm. And the stupid kickoff matches. I hate the kickoff matches. I I don't see what the point is. I mean, if if they're going to have these matches, why not even include them in the card? I know they should have, but... Anyway, uh, as for the NBA, we saw the f- game one of the of the Western Conference semifinals between the Spurs and the Thunder. All Spurs all the time in this one. I'm telling you, San Antonio right now is Golden State's biggest threat to the NBA title. It's just a shame that they uh, had to be in the same conference 
because right now they're in line to face, face each other for the Western Conference title. 30 this, points from LaMarcus Aldridge. What a find the Spurs have gotten in this kid. I mean, granted, he, he came uh, from a Trailblazers team where he really was really wallowing in his own uh, superstardom. I think that the Trailblazers really wasted Aldridge as a, as a star player over there. Now he's got his best shot to win that elusive NBA title after nine years in Portland. Speaking of his former team, they lost by 12 points to the uh, Warriors, 118-106. Clay, Clay Thompson has gone three straight games of seven three-pointers, had 37 points to lead them to a big victory. Mm -hmm. In the two weeks that they're going to be without uh, Curry and all that with the MCL yep. screen. Meanwhile, in the Eastern Conference, let's just wrap up what happened in the Eastern Conference. In the first round, Cleveland dismantled Detroit. And then there were a couple of series that went seven games. Toronto just last night held off Indiana in a really game uh, uh, contest between those two. And Miami just shook off Charlotte especially when they were on the ropes in game six. These last two, well, game six was where Dwayne Wade really showed why he is a, a, a three-time NBA champion. That's number one. Number two, how about the defensive job that the Heat made against the Hornets in that seventh game, limiting them to just 32% shooting from the field? So now it's going to be Heat and Raptors in the Eastern Conference semifinals, and tonight... The Cavaliers are going to play the Hawks in the other Eastern Conference semifinal as the Hawks wound up doing away with the Celtics. Well, actually, right now they're playing each other on TNT at 7 o'clock, and right now the Cavs are pretty much dominating after the first mm -hmm. quarter. It was like 30-15 at one point. It's and last night, well, last year, uh, the, the Cavs and Hawks played each other for the Eastern Conference finals. Now this is the rematch. I, know, I think it's going to be the same result probably in five games. Mm -hmm. As for the NHL right now, the Penguins and the Capitals, the two premier players, their team's playing each other. T.J. Oshie with the hat trick in game one to lead the Caps to a 4-3 victory. Then game two came Eric Fair's game tying, uh, uh, tie breaking goal in the third period to lead the Penguins to a 2-1 victory. Series even at one all right now. As for the Islanders and the Lightning, Islanders uh, had a three-goal outburst in the first period, including two from Eric Prince to win 5-3 to three. Oh, yeah. in game one. And then game two was the uh, unfortunate incident where a pair of Islanders collided against each other and it wound up leading to what was probably the turning point of the game and w when the Lightning wound up scoring and they came away with a 4-1 win. But now, yep. most importantly, the Islanders have home ice in Brooklyn for the next two games. If they can hold serve, I think they'll be in really good shape going into uh, – game five at a potential game six they just better look out for Kushrov and they better look out for Tyler Johnson this one these two despite all the injuries that the Lightning had don't let that fool you this team has so much depth mm -hmm. that you know they are going to be a tough out as for the Western Conference the St. Louis Blues and the Dallas Stars of course uh, St. Louis won the first game two to one then in overtime David Backus in game two got the game tying goal they won four to three St. Louis it's one all in that series the Sharks are leading the other series against the Nashville Predators 2 to nothing, heading into Nashville. Yep. 4 to 5 2 in the first game and a winning 3 to 2. Joe Pavelski with the tie breaking goal with just eight minutes left in regulation. Mm hmm. Unbelievable. Yep. This is, that's going to do it for us, folks, with about a minute left. I just want to give a special word of thanks to Kenny Graham, who's on the other side of the glass taking care of stuff for today. <laughs> Uh, I, once again, would be remiss if we did not say thanks to everybody over at Wagner College. They have been so gracious to us. And, Eric, of course, thank you as well. Thank you, sir. For everyone here, I'm Jamie. And I'm Eric. We hope to see you next time, folks. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and let's go Islanders. Definitely, and let's go Jets and Giants for next year. Yep. Enjoy the rest of your week. Good night. Good night. Thank you.